Good evening and welcome to tonight's program. The Lincoln Presidential Foundation was proud to officially launch Warning Signs, Lincoln's response to rising threats to freedom, justice, and democracy this fall. This project made possible with generous support from Iron Mountain is both history and a call to action for all citizens to be engaged in the responsibilities we each have in self-government. The project includes an array of new resources, including a companion docuseries, will be premiering the film's part two, Deepening Divides for You, in just a moment, followed by a discussion led by our president and CEO, Aaron Carlson Mass, and featuring Dr. Rachel Sheldon. My name is Phyllis Evans, and I'm the Senior Director of Development for the Foundation. Before we begin our program this evening, I'd like to thank each of you for joining us and remind you that, the following, that following tonight's presentation, we will entertain questions from the audience. Please type your questions throughout the program in the Q&A box below, and we'll get to as many as we possibly can. And now, join me for the premiere of the film, Part Two of Warning Signs, Lincoln's Response to Rising Tensions in the 1850s. Compromise is built into the Constitution. And in a way, compromise with evil is built into the Constitution because there is no clear sense from the Constitution of whether slavery should be allowed or should not be allowed. That members of the founding generation determined was the only way to put the country together. It created a situation that I think people still believe today that, well, because the founders said it, it can't be wrong. And as a result, African Americans have been battling even for the most fundamental equality before the law and, and still are. Conflict over slavery continues. And in 1854, there is more interest in organizing new territory in that former area known as the Louisiana Purchase. And Lincoln's rival in Illinois, Stephen Douglas, a Democrat, wants to help get this territory organized. And so in 1854, he proposes something that comes to be known as the Kansas-Nebraska Act. What he wants to do is apply something called popular sovereignty to this new territory. Popular sovereignty actually was something that was part of the Compromise of 1850. New territory that came in in New Mexico and Utah had been prescribed as using popular sovereignty to determine whether slavery would exist in their borders. It was the idea that the people rule, the people are sovereign. But in this particular case, it was applied to mean that the people of the territory would be able to vote whether slavery would exist in their borders. So this existed in the Compromise of 1850, and Douglas set out to apply it to Kansas and Nebraska. The Kansas-Nebraska Act caused a hell of a storm. It repealed the Missouri Compromise. That territory that had been free was now open to the idea of popular sovereignty. The white people who moved there would vote either yes or no, will we have slavery or not? You have Northerners and Southerners flocking into Kansas, trying to make it either slave or free. And in the process, they bludgeon one another through a time we know as Bleeding Kansas. Lincoln saw the Kansas-Nebraska Act as rooted in violence, violence to the Constitution, violence to the principles of compromise that earlier generations of Americans had settled in 1820. He saw it as an overthrow of a compromise that had been intended to make the Union last and that had worked for more than 30 years. Lincoln wrote a private letter to his closest friend, Joshua Speed in 1855. And speaking about the Kansas-Nebraska Act, he said, I look upon that enactment not as a law, but as violence from the beginning. It was conceived in violence, passed in violence, is maintained in violence, and is being executed in violence. Now, Stephen Douglas argued that the Kansas-Nebraska Act was rooted in popular sovereignty, this is democracy, this is how it works. But Lincoln pointed out that what was really going on was that white people were voting to decide how to govern black people. And that is not government by consent. 
That is despotism, Lincoln said, when one group of people gets to vote and decide how they are going to govern another. In 1857, Chief Justice Roger Brooke Taney of Maryland rules in a 7-2 to two decision two things. One, that Dred Scott and his family, he is an enslaved black man from Missouri, cannot sue in a federal court, ought not to have sued at the lower circuit court level because he is either a slave or a descendant of slaves. Taney made the point that it was race, not slavery, that determined one's citizenship in this country. And so... Tani first rules that Dred Scott didn't have a right to sue in a federal court because he's a black man. Second thing he went on to say that wasn't relevant to that particular decision. He didn't need to go on to say this, but the second thing he ruled was that Congress in 1820 acted unconstitutionally when it crafted the Missouri Compromise of 1820. Our practice historically had been that Congress could do this. So when Tani says, uh, they shouldn't have done it. They didn't have that right. They didn't have that power. Lincoln is horrified by the Dred Scott decision, as many people are. At the same time, the Supreme Court does not have the same kind of power in the 19th century that it does today. And so many people simply ignored the Supreme Court. They said, we don't agree, we're not going to go along with this. Uh, they engaged in all kinds of nullification of this idea. Certain states even passed laws and passed pronouncements invalidating the Dred Scott decision. But Lincoln knew the power of this decision because of course Southerners were constantly claiming that this decision was the right decision. So Lincoln responded by saying that the Supreme Court simply does not have that power. Lincoln repeats this about the Supreme Court many times and he refers to Dred Scott in these terms of being, you know, just one decision by this court and not the true pronouncement of how American society should operate. And he gives probably the best encapsulation of this in his first inaugural address. And he says, if the policy of the government upon vital questions affecting the whole people is to be irrevocably fixed by the decisions of the Supreme Court, the people have ceased to become their own rulers. And, and this is such an important point, right? Because he is saying, yes, the Supreme Court made this decision. However, we are the people. We are the people who get to decide what our constitution means. In the Dred Scott decision, Roger Tawney had said that the state of life for African-Americans had improved between 1787 when the Constitution was written and 1857 when the Dred Scott decision was handed down. And Lincoln responded by saying that that assertion was based on assumed historical facts that were not really true. And Lincoln showed how the state of being for African Americans had gotten worse over that time period. In the 1770s and 1780s, African Americans could vote in many states. The right to vote was restricted on account of how much property you had in most of the states, the original 13 colonies and original states, not based on the color of your skin. It was only in the 1820s and 1830s that that right to vote was stripped away from black men in the states and then was denied to black men in new states. And so Lincoln pointed out, contrary to Tawney's position, that black men were losing rights over this period of time. Life was not getting better. In the early days of the American Republic, states could abolish slavery within their borders if they wanted to. But in the 1830s, in the aftermath of Nat Turner's rebellion, some states decided to prohibit owners from freeing their slaves. And so Lincoln points out that things are actually worse for African Americans now in 1857 than they were when the Constitution was written in 1787. And so he goes to Springfield and then Peoria and delivers these addresses where he calls on Americans to stick to the principles of the founding. At one point in the speech, he says, our Republican robe is soiled and trailed in the dust. And he calls on Americans to repurify that Republican robe, to wash it clean, to cling back to the principles of the American Revolution and to the idea that slavery was on the path to ultimate extinction. This is my favorite Lincoln document. It comes from Proverbs. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in pictures of silver. And what's interesting to me about this is this is just a fragment of something 
that he wrote, and we don't have the beginning. And I can tell you what my interpretation is, which is that the apple of gold is the Declaration of Independence. He, he, he says so himself. But judging from everything else he's ever said about the Declaration of Independence, he's specifically talking about equality among human beings, that all human beings are equally endowed by their creator with the right to be alive, the right to be free, and the right to pursue happiness. And slavery has no part in this. Greetings, everyone, and thank you for joining us for tonight's speaker program and the second screening of our new docu-series, Warning Signs, Lincoln's Response to Rising Tensions in the 1850s. We are so appreciative of Iron Mountain for their foresight and support of this project as part of their Journey to Equal Rights Initiative. Time and again, I have witnessed other adults, including teachers, express dismay about never having learned about a person or moment in history that seems to them very meaningful or pivotal. They may have had great educators, but those educators followed a curriculum that couldn't or wouldn't account for the complete story. Simply put, our civic education has to continue whenever our formal education journey ends because it's a crucial part of being an informed and engaged citizen in our democracy. Part of the reason we chose to focus this project on the decade prior to the Civil War is that there were important perspectives to unpack from that period of time, a time of tremendous turmoil and political polarization. We're joined tonight by Dr. Rachel Sheldon. She specializes in the long 19th century. Sheldon received her PhD from the University of Virginia in 2011. Her research and teaching interests include slavery and abolition, the Civil War, the US South, and political and constitutional history. She's the author of Washington Brotherhood, Politics, Social Life, and the Coming of the Civil War, published by the University of North Carolina Press in 2013. It received honorable mention for the Wiley Silver Prize for the best first book on the American Civil War. Washington Brotherhood explores the social lives of congressmen in Washington in the 1840s and 1850s, illustrating how their personal relationships influence their political behavior. And the book argues that understanding congressional politics requires moving beyond the official spaces of the Capitol building and instead looking to the unofficial political spaces in hotels and boarding houses, parties and dinners, and in the intimacies of Washington, DC. Professor Sheldon is also co-editor with Gary Gallagher of A Political Nation, New Directions in Mid-19th Century American Political History. Her current book project, The Political Supreme Court, examines the political world of US Supreme Court justices in the early 19th century to the 1890s. Rachel, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I'd like to start first with a broad question to set the stage. It's not uncommon for people to draw parallels between events in the past, whether their own individual past or that of a larger community, including the nation and their lives today. It's a useful activity in many ways to consider similarities and differences. Based on your scholarship, would you please describe American politics in the mid 1800s and how that differs from today's politics in America? Well, do you have all night? <laughs> uh, you know, this is a topic that is really near and dear to my heart because politics in the 19th century was so different in so many ways uh, from what it is today, in large part because the process of participating in politics was so different. So let me give you a couple of examples of that. First of all, the process of voting. Today, we have the secret ballot. We have what it's, it's called actually the Australian ballot. Uh, where you go and you you have this secrecy where you're able to fill out a ballot and, and turn it in. Did not exist in the 19th century, not until the uh, 1890s did the Australian ballot take hold. So people participated in much more social ways in voting. They came together in town squares. People knew their neighbors and they knew how their neighbors were voting. Uh, and they were able to sort of have a very close personal relationship with their politics in a way that is sort of more difficult in the secret ballot age, though much more democratic, you might say, in the secret ballot age. A second major thing that is different is that 
newspapers were political organs. Now, maybe we think that newspapers today are a little bit more like political organs, but these were self-consciously political organs and they were run by partisans. They were run by um, politicians often, people who then went on to become congressmen and senators. And they were the ones that helped organize this politics. So in general, if you wanted to go to the voting booth, you did not get a ballot. You cut out a ballot from a newspaper, what they called a ticket, that's where we get that language from, uh, and would bring it to the polling place. Or newspaper editors would bring copies to the polling place and they would bring along their um, thugs and their alcohol to try and also get you to vote. So in many ways, the voting process was much less democratic in that way. At the same time, particip participation was enormous. So in the 19th century, you have people voting in the 70th percentile, the 70th percentile of how many people are voting compared to today, highest votes, you know, in the 60s. So at, in certain elections, you have up to 80% of the voting population voting. And, and so the engagement with politics is huge. And then the last thing I'll say about this is, of course, the population that is voting is white and male. And that is a very different experience from our uh, our process today, and it was self-consciously so. It was a process that had, um, as we heard from actually Jonathan White in the in the video, had actually become less democratic when it came to race and gender. Early on in the United States, some women could vote, some Black Americans could vote, and still some did uh, in this period. But in general, there was an expansion of the white vote at the expense of the Black vote and of women's votes. So there are moments in which democracy is growing, but also when it's contracting. Yeah, that's an excellent point too, that it's not linear and hasn't been historically as well. That's right. So you've written elsewhere too, that 19th century parties were more fluid and the idea of bipartisanship as we think of it today did not exist. At least, you know, again, not as we think of it today, but there might have still been, you know, oppositional sides that were working to compromise. What were Lincoln's political views and attitudes regarding political parties? So political parties were useful ways of getting out your ideas about the future of the nation. So today we think about parties as sort of top down organizations, right? You have the national political organization that has a platform and that has people vote because they are belonging to that political party. In the 19th century, it was very easy to create new political parties. As we see in the 1850s, there are all kinds of new political parties and some that Lincoln flirts with. He flirts with uh, the Know Nothing Party. He eventually becomes a Republican um, and he had been a Whig before that. And, and it was really emblematic of how often you could change political parties when the issues at hand would change. So his view, was really about how do I get to the ultimate goal that I have here and how can I use this political party to achieve that? In the Civil War itself, Lincoln is gonna change his views about where it should go as well. Uh, he creates the new National Union Party in 1864 and runs on the new National Union Party ticket as opposed to the Republican ticket. So our conception of parties as being these permanent organizations is really different from how people understood it then. And so conflict between parties was not a binary. It was often involving three or four political parties and things would shift. The idea that you would cooperate with the other political party was insane to people. They thought, why would we do this? We believe that they are doing something wrong for the nation. So for us, we are going to force our views and try to convince people that this is the way we ought to go. Uh, and you could do that in part because of all of this fluidity. Mm. That's really interesting since, as, as also noted in the film, the U.S. Constitution is really built in this on this idea of compromise. And so, yes, yes fight for the views and the positions that you are that you think are very important, but also it's, it's a compromise document and then there's compromise decades after. And you point out that it, it's even built on compromise with evil, meaning the yes. institution of slavery. And there are numerous examples of people who opposed slavery during that era, not just abolitionists or enslaved people themselves, but also enslavers. I'm always reminded of that Patrick Henry letter on the slave trade, where he acknowledges his belief that slavery is wrong morally, politically, um, even though he's a slave owner. But he also kicks the can, so to speak. Yeah. You know, he says, well, it, it's, it would be inconvenient, essentially, to do anything about it now. And there's a future opportunity when that lamentable evil um, can be ended. 
why? I mean, that's, that's a question that I've heard from so many, you know, uh, students, visitors, program participants over the year, and I'd love to know how you answer that question. Why did colonies that had already abolished slavery, individuals who thought this was not only morally wrong, but politically wrong, wrong for the direction of the country, why would they think compromise with colonies that insisted on protecting the institution of slavery were necessary or even desirable to form this experiment in self-government? Boy, it's such a great question, and I think it's it's a re there's a really complicated answer to it. But I think one one really important element of thinking about the foundation of the nation is that we assume the Constitution is a legal document that is written in stone that we spend all of our lives trying to understand from a legal perspective. But the framers of the Constitution actually didn't really see it they, that way. They mostly thought about it as a series of political ideas. And those political ideas would be worked out over time. And there was no expectation that the Constitution was going to remain what it was in uh, 1789. There was an expectation that it would change, both through amendment and through the process of evaluating their political moment. So in addition to being um, ideological, they also had political abilities. They wanted to form a new nation and they understood that this was the only way to do it politically. Now, that certainly doesn't excuse their behavior, but it does tell you a little bit about how they thought about the moment and then what they thought was possible afterwards. Things changed a lot in the first decade of uh, the new nation where people who had argued for this more expansive view of the constitution then all of a sudden started arguing the opposite. James Madison being the most, um, common example of that, of saying, yes, you know, the Constitution is written in stone, we actually have to go along with it. Uh, he had not argued that initially. So a lot of the political circumstances change. And these guys are politicians, and they understand understand governance as a political experiment. So they are constantly considering the circumstances through that prism. And if we can sort of step back and think about the Constitution as a series of ideals, of a framework for governance, as opposed to written rules, then it's easier to see why the framers decided to go the way they did. Excellent, Rachel, that's really helpful. Um, and it also helps set up the context for all of these subsequent compromises, the Compromise of 1820, Compromise of 1850, which we heard about a little bit in the film, and the Kansas-Nebraska Act. Um, which effectively served to sort of respond to that moment in time, try to do something to hold the country together. But in, in some ways, you know, with Kansas-Nebraska Act, as, as John White pointed out in the video, it feels like it's repealing earlier compromises and earlier agreements, um, and that some of the backlash to it might have been over that. Can you say a bit more about how Lincoln viewed compromise in general and then the Kansas-Nebraska Act specifically, and what was the practical result of that? Lincoln was actually very much in favor of compromise. His, you know, his hero was Henry Clay, and Henry Clay was the author of the Missouri Compromise. Um, he's the purported author of the Compromise of 1850, but that's not actually true. Don't tell anybody. It was actually Stephen Douglas. So, so really, the uh, the the main ideals that he grows up with is this idea of compromise for the nation, and that doesn't necessarily mean compromise of your principles. It means trying to come together to save the union because the union is the most important thing. The idea of democracy in the United States is the most important thing. So if compromise can happen, then we have to go forward with it. This is tricky, right? Because your political views and your ideological views do not always mesh. But when it comes to the Kansas-Nebraska Act, Lincoln saw it not only as bad ideologically, but bad politically. It didn't actually achieve what he believed the goals of governance were which were to create a society that would be on the path toward freedom. He believed that that was really important. And so the Kansas-Nebraska Act for him was a step backward. You had all of these compromises that were going to allow for more free territory in the West and the Kansas-Nebraska Act took that away. It made it easier to have slavery in the territories that had been set aside for freedom. And so for him, this was not just an ideological problem, but like a problem of governance, a problem of how do we actually achieve the goals that we have for the nation. And how did Lincoln think those goals could or should be achieved? 
I, he he uh, joins the Republican Party in large part because he believes in the idea of setting slavery on the path toward extinction. Now, Lincoln says several times that this does not mean next week, next year, next decade even. I mean, he talks about the 20th century as being the time when slavery might die out. And and we, we have to grapple with that. I, I think we often want Lincoln to be all of our heroes. You know, I mean, he's really he's really inspiring. I find him extremely inspiring, but he is also very flawed. And his view of slavery was not, it's going to be able to be dealt with immediately. And it took him a long time to come to these decisions about how race ought to play, how civil rights ought to play in the broader story of American history. But he does believe that the nation should be on this path toward ending slavery and that slavery was wrong. Slavery is wrong. That is a true belief of Lincoln. So for him, the Kansas Nebraska, Nebraska Act completely upends that. It upends the possibility for that. Uh, and he believes that it's fundamentally wrong. Mm -hmm. Well, and as you pointed out earlier, Stephen Douglas is, is you know, pulling a lot of strings both in the background and in the foreground. And one of his arguments is that, well, hey, hey, folks, this is just popular sovereignty, which sounds so great, um, yep. except for, as you pointed out earlier, uh, how many people are actually actually have the right to vote. So the, the will of the people, it's not really the will of the greatest number of people who are consenting to this. But even if you couldn't vote, there were other ways that you could maybe make your case or improve your condition. And, and in terms of self-emancipation, this is also something that we see over time, you could bring your case to court. Uh, this is something Lincoln as a lawyer was very familiar with, not that he was always necessarily to your point on the right side of the case as we might want him to be, the case that was aligned with his ideals versus just, I believe everyone should have representation in court. That's another ideal of his, of course. Um, and that brings us to the Dred Scott decision and Lincoln's response to that. Chief Justice Roger Taney wrote the opinion on the Dred Scott case. He's only the fifth chief justice in US history and the first three served for, I added it up, less than 12 years combined. We're on number 17 now, just so everyone has that context. There's only been 17 chief justices, 46 presidents. Who was Justice Taney as a person and an important figure? And what was the significance of the decision he authored regarding the Dred Scott case, in your opinion? Yeah, I mean, this is a really important moment in thinking about Dred Scott because um, so much of our own understanding of this period is grounded in that. The Supreme Court has become the most important part of the government on everyone's minds, right? It is in the news all the time. And so we imagine the Dred Scott decision to be much like any of the decisions in the last uh, term or in the mm -hmm. middle of the 20th century or any other time where you think about these Supreme Court cases as so important. And the Dred Scott decision in a lot of ways was just a, a, a formal pronouncement of what many of the Washington politicians at that time believed. So mm -hmm. we imagine this enormous outcry and there was among Republicans, among black Americans, uh, among people who believed it was wrong. But in general, it actually represented a majority of Americans in this time, uh, white Americans surely, but a majority of Americans. And so the Dred Scott decision did produce anger and it did produce nullification of the decision in places across the North. Uh, and Lincoln, again, is horrified by it. He thinks it is wrong in every possible way. Um, citizenship, which is a concept we think is so important now, was a, was a much more um, hazy idea in the 19th century. And in particular, the idea that residency related to citizenship and that you are a citizen of a state rather than of the United States in this period meant that mm, the Supreme Court was really getting involved in a question that they didn't really need to, that really was not their purview. This was Lincoln's view, right? Um, so for him, he sees this as sort of a grand conspiracy. He says in the Lincoln Douglas Bates um, and several times, although eventually he stopped saying it, I think maybe somebody told him to stop saying it, uh, that, that the Dred Scott um, decision is sort of the end of the conspiracy to perpetuate slavery in the United States. Uh, four men responsible for this that track from the Kansas Nebraska Act to the Dred Scott decision. Franklin Pierce, who had been president during the Kansas Nebraska Act, his Illinois rival, Stephen Douglas, who was responsible for the Kansas Nebraska Act, 
James Buchanan, the incoming president, and Roger Taney, and that these four men had conspired to try to make slavery permanent in the United States. And he's not totally crazy because of course these men are talking to each other all the time. Um, James Buchanan and Stephen Douglas hated each other. So that's the one problem with his theory. But in general, uh, there was a lot more communication in the 19th century between Supreme Court justices and politicians and other parts of the government. And so it's not totally off the wall to suggest that there might be this kind of conversation happening. And surely they all did want slavery to continue. This was not false to say that they did. Douglas often claimed that he didn't he didn't care either way, but you know, that's, that's not really true if you're promoting the Kansas Nebraska Act, so. Yeah, that's a good <laughs> point. You noted that several states nullified um, the Supreme Court decision by passing laws. Can you talk a little bit more about that and explain what that meant? Yeah, so. Um, that look? Yeah, so the, so the Supreme Court today, we think of as the final authority on the Constitution. We, we generally as a society have accepted that, but that really wasn't the case in the 19th century. Uh, in general, people understood themselves to be the keeper of the Constitution. And that worked itself out in a variety of different ways. It meant that the Supreme Court could say what it wanted, uh, but so could the president and so could Congress and the people ultimately determined what they thought. So in states across the union, people would look to Supreme Court decisions and decide, eh, I'm not really sure I agree with that. I'm not going to go along with it. So Wisconsin in particular is a state that just sort of says, nope, we don't agree with this. Uh, they issue set the governor issues several um, statements saying we will not go along with Dred Scott. The legislature passes laws saying we will not go along with Dred Scott. Um, there are elections that are based around the idea of whether Dred Scott is something that you would approve of or not approve of, uh, in part because this had been um, sort of inserted into a broader problem of fugitive slaves in the North in this period, where enslaved people are running away to the North and people who are um, sympathetic to, to Black Americans are trying to help them. And then following the um, Fugitive Slave Act in 1850, as part of the Compromise of 1850, they are being compelled not to do that. They're being compelled to act on behalf of the United States to return enslaved people to their enslavers. Uh, and so there's a lot of anger among people who are opposed to slavery and Dred Scott sort of comes in right at that moment and allows people to sort of say, okay, here, I'm pointing to this exact problem right here. Got it. Let's stay on the Supreme Court for a moment. We can't not because you have such yeah. a depth of knowledge in Supreme Court history. So um, for all of those writing in questions, all of your Supreme Court questions, now's the time to do that. Um, yeah. There is this oft repeated claim that you've, you've referenced a little bit that the Supreme Court is supposed to be, if not nonpartisan or nonpolitical, the least partisan or politicized of the three branches of government. We hear that talking point or variations of it repeated quite a bit even though polls show that the majority of Americans don't think that's actually the case. Um, what's your response to that based on the historical record? Is the Supreme Court partisan and political and how has that ebbed and flowed over time if it has? Yeah, this is this is part of what I'm writing my book about. So I'm, I have a lot of interest in it. Um, the Supreme Court was an intensely partisan um, uh, institution, but also the justices themselves were intensely partisan. So one of the justices on the Supreme Court who, who writes one of the um, dissents in Dred Scott, John McLean of Ohio, uh, is anti-slavery. In 1856, he runs for president. He is the runner up on the Republican ticket. Who supports him? Abraham Lincoln. He wants to see John McLean as the nominee for president. There were justices who were candidates for president in almost every election in the 19th century, and people did not think this was weird. And the real reason for it is that the Supreme Court did not have the kind of power that it has today. We might be really horrified to see John Roberts or Elena Kagan or Samuel Alito decide that they are going to run for president. But part of that has to do with their role in determining the Constitution and our views of that. In the 19th century, it seemed quite logical that someone who participated in governance would then be a good choice for president. And that's why Lincoln supported McLean. He thought McLean would be the first, you know, real anti-slavery president. And that was really exciting. That was a real possibility. Uh, there are several people, including Thaddeus Stevens, who thought that if John McLean had been nominated in 1856, the Republicans would have won that election. Boy, wouldn't things have been different then. <laughs> 
Yeah, and it's interesting too to see that go in, in the opposite direction too. Um, you note that in Lincoln's first inaugural, he said, quote, but if the policy of the government upon vital questions affecting the whole people is to be irrevocably fixed by decisions of the Supreme Court, it is plain that the people will have ceased to be their own rulers, having turned their government over to the despotism of the few life officers composing the court. What did Lincoln mean by that? And I think, you know, I just want to hear you talk about this more, including the life officers part of this and sort of unpack what he's saying, because so often, first of all, the second inaugural gets more attention than the first. And when yes. the first does, it tends to be about sort of the olive branch that he's, you know, extending to the seceding states, right? But you yeah. point, you you highlight this other really key part here. And I'd appreciate you unpacking that for our audience. Yeah. So I mean, one of the things that people understood about the Supreme Court is that because it was a political body, the personnel would change and the decisions would change as soon as the personnel changed. And this was something that Lincoln said all the time and lots of other politicians said all the time. Once the Republicans get in power, they will change the composition of the Supreme Court. And guess what? That's exactly what Lincoln did. He changed the composition of the Supreme Court. But in the meantime, it didn't mean that you had to go along with everything that the Supreme Court said. So he would have been very understanding of what happened in Wisconsin. He he was a, a man very committed to law and order. So there were limits to what he thought was appropriate. Uh, but in the case of uh, the Dred Scott decision, the Missouri Compromise is something that the um, Supreme Court says is unconstitutional. And so Congress does not have the right to legislate for the territories to decide whether slavery should exist in the territories according to the Dred Scott decision. During the Civil War, they just ignore that entirely. They free all the territories. They free Washington, DC. This is not consistent with the Dred Scott decision. And they don't care. They're not like, oh no, we are violating what the Supreme Court said. They're saying we're in power. We have the power to interpret the constitution and this is how we are interpreting it. So the Supreme Court, you know, quite famously, um, Hamilton said it has neither the power of the purse nor the sword. Uh, and so it cannot enforce its own decisions. We as the people have to give the court that authority. Congress has to give them the jurisdiction and we as the people have to give them that authority. And so we can take it away anytime we want. Uh, they might not like that very much, but that is certainly the way Lincoln viewed it in the 19th century and the and the court couldn't do anything about it. It's not like Roger Taney said, no, I'm going to come to the White House and you know tell you that you're wrong. He disagreed, but he couldn't do anything about it. Right. Did Lincoln's views of the Supreme Court change after he was elected president and did it influence his nomination for a new chief justice in Sam and Chase? Oh, so I mean, this is a great question in part because Lincoln takes a while to actually fill the empty seats on the Supreme Court. I mean, that should give you some indication of how much he thought of the Supreme Court. It takes so long for him to fill these positions. The court is like really, you know, there are only like five or six people meeting because they can't get all of the justices. They've lost them. There are two that are dead that they haven't filled those positions. Uh, so there's that point. Um, he does put his somewhat rival, Sam and Chase, on the Supreme Court as the next chief justice in 1864 when Roger Taney dies. Uh, I always think this is the greatest following of Roger Taney. Um, Sam and Chase was an incredible lawyer in the 1850s, just, I mean, unbelievable in his legal skill. And he had argued cases in front of the Supreme Court before. Um, he had very close relationships with John McLean and some of the other justices. And so he goes on the court and is immediately in opposition to everything that Tawny ever stood for. Uh, although they both end up sort of becoming Democrats later. That's that fluidity piece I was telling you about. Uh, he had been a Republican and he changes his mind. But yeah, the court changes enormously. Um, and the really important thing that happens in the Civil War is that the nation is expanding, right? You have more and more people moving further and further westward. And so the reach of the Supreme Court has to shift. So in the 19th century, Supreme Court justices did something called riding circuit. That meant that they served in Washington for part of the year. And then they went to their circuit courts that they were assigned to took off their Supreme Court hat, put on circuit judge hat, and ruled in circuit cases that sometimes would be ap appealed to the Supreme Court. And so they would travel to these spaces 
and interact with the people. So that's another really big difference from today with the Supreme Court is that the Supreme Court was viewed as being tied to the people in this way in their circuits and not sort of separate from the political world uh, as we imagine it to be today. Mm, that's one of those themes that comes up again and again about how, um, how much access we have to not only our elected officials, but as you're pointing out, different branches of the federal government versus the state or local government and how that's changed over time, sometimes for security reasons, you know, I mean, yes. with, with each presidential assassination, suddenly there's, you know, a, a bunch uh, more security uh, protocols that are put in place, but we see that with every branch of government and at every level Absolutely. of government, it seems. Yeah. Um, that's, I think the effect of that on democracy is a topic for another day, but um, two, Maybe I'm so. going to try to squeeze in two more questions before we turn over to the audience um, questions. In another part of the series, you pointed out that it's not until the second half of the 20th century that we have some, something approaching a truly representative system, a, a, a truer democracy. Um, the passage of the Voting Rights Act, 24th Amendment, and even the 26th Amendment, you know, throughout the 1960s and 70s. What makes voting rights so essential and yet so controversial historically? Yeah, uh, so many people in the 19th century believed that their, their ability to participate in government was so tied to their rights to vote. And so, so many of the um, efforts on behalf of people who could not vote were directed in that way. Uh, they were directed towards having that political power. Didn't mean they didn't have other political power. Petitioning, for example, was a very um, important way that people who could not vote participated. And people who um, couldn't vote also tried to influence political parties. But getting the vote meant being able to shape governance. And so that was the fight. And it was the fight throughout the 19th century, it was the fight throughout the 20th century to have that opportunity to be able to participate in government. I think, you know, sometimes we take for granted our ability to do that. So many people died to have the opportunity to vote in so many ways. So many people were prevented from participating fully. Uh, and, you know, one thing that doesn't get quite as much attention as voting is participation in juries, which is mm -hmm. something that the founders were really interested in. People participating in government by being jurists, by being on the jury, being able to determine uh, what happens and seeing what happens to their fellow man. And so as a result, these are things that people are fighting for. They're trying to get that right to, be, to vote, to participate in governance, to be elected to office. Those are sort of the fundamental notions of what it means to be part of democracy. And so it doesn't really happen until we get to the second half of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. From your perspective as a historian, what's your key takeaway from this time period, the 1850s, that you consider and think about when you're exercising your civic responsibility today, Rachel? Oh, it's such a good question. And my head is exploding with answers to you. But um, I think the most important thing that I think about when I think about the 19th century, and this is the 1850s, the Civil War, and even the time after, is just how fragile the democratic experiment was then and still is. And people had to fight in order to make democracy work. It was not something that worked on its own. And Lincoln understood that. That is why he was so committed to all of these ideals and why he pushed for them and why he wanted to participate in government. Because to him, it was a fragile experiment worth fighting for. And, and we might be seeing more concerns about that today. People certainly are paying more attention to it. Um, but for many years, we took for granted the idea that democracy was going to be there for us. And so I think a lot about how Lincoln must have felt in the 1850s, wondering if democracy would survive. Mm. All right, our first audience question comes from Melvin. He asks, how would Lincoln respond to today's political climate? Oh, um, well, I think he'd be sort of horrified by cell phones, don't you think? Uh, that's probably the first thing. Um, no, I think, um, I think some of it would look very normal to him because the vitriol was very normal. Um, in fact, violence was very normal. That's something I didn't mention earlier, but part of the experience of voting and participating in governance was, was violence. Um, Congress was a very violent place in the 19th century. Washington DC was kind of a pit 
uh, I say I'm I'm in Washington right now. I can <laughs> say that I'm allowed to. Um, so so it was kind of a, a dirty and violent and disgusting place, and people were fighting each other all the time. Uh, so he would have been sort of familiar with the vitriol and with some of the violence. Uh, certainly wouldn't have condoned it. He was a law and order kind of man, uh, but he would have been familiar with it. He would have been familiar with extreme language. He would have been familiar with um, what people in the 19th century called bunkum speech making. Uh, these are giving speeches to um, basically an empty room so that your constituents can read uh, that you have given a speech calling out someone on the other side of the aisle. Uh, super common in the 19th century, still common today. Uh, people speak for Buncombe all the time. So he would have been familiar with that. Um, I think he would have been very surprised by the idea of bipartisanship and by the idea of permanent political parties. That was not something he was familiar with. Uh, and so he might wonder why it is so hard for us today to actually change our political system, to actually change parties and change the way we approach it. Of course, the size of the federal government and the size of the United States has changed mm -hmm. dramatically. And so that changes the context. But I think all of those things would occur to him. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, for that matter, we were talking earlier about the, the or, how it was this experiment in, you know, el electoral democracy might be a, a shaky term for the first hundred years or so of, of the U.S. government. But the, the fact that it was an experiment, there was one, only one other democracy, I think at the time in Switzerland. So it, maybe the comparison to today and how many democracies there are of so many shapes and sizes would have been a positive thing for him. Oh, absolutely. Oh, that's such an excellent point because one of the things that Lincoln cares so much about and his speeches in the Civil War uh, really indicate this is being that example for the world. So that is something that he would have cared a lot about. It's a great point. Mm -hmm. So question two comes from Wayne, who asks if politics of the 1850s were as polarized as they seem to be today. Um, yes, I think so. Uh, uh, one of the things I think is really interesting is that um, we have a lot more knowledge of what people who disagree with us think. Um, we have a lot more access to that. There was a lot more disinformation, although maybe we are in a different information age now too, but there was a lot more disinformation and there was just a lot of not knowing what people who were opposed to you thought. So in that way, um, polarization sort of feeds on this sort of conspiratorial thinking in a lot of cases. Um, Washington politicians, however, tended to be less um, concerned about that split. They believed that they could come together and, and save the union because that was their role. Uh, so I don't know, maybe this is again, a, a, um, a callback to the 19th century from today is that you had people inside the Washington bubble who believed that they could fix the country and they fail miserably. Of course, you know, we have a civil war, um, but it was not necessarily representative of what they thought when they made really nasty speeches on the floor of the House or the Senate. Uh, and, and that really like made people even more angry and more concerned about the future of the country. But let me just say one other thing about this, which is like the issue of slavery is really worth that kind of anger, right? I mean, that's what this was all about. This was all about the future of the nation. Um, and people were angry because they did not want to be enslaved. They believe they might become enslaved, right? Lincoln said this several times. You know, it is a <clears throat> it is a standard feature of 19th century thinking to worry that if you are not independent, if you cannot think for yourself, if you cannot have the power to vote, then you are enslaved. That you are an enslaved person, and they use that language. It's sort of offensive, right? Because it's not actual enslavement, but they use that language all the time. Uh, so it was a fight over the future of, you know, human life in a lot of ways. Yeah. Excellent points. Um, Richard um, references back to when you stated that Lincoln used different political parties or flirted with different political parties, in some cases, Whig, no nothing Republican to achieve his goals, and asks if you could elaborate what those goals were and how they evolved as his political party choices changed or what, what oh, yeah. his end goal was. I'm so sorry, Erin, can you repeat that for me? I think I cut out for a second. Yeah, sure. 
So Richard uh, references when you said that Lincoln used different political parties with no nothing Republican to achieve his goals and asked if you could elaborate what those goals were and how they evolved as he made his different choices of party. Yeah, so I mean, a lot of his goals in the 1840s and the early 1850s are about the future of the nation economically. Um, he really believes in um, the government sponsorship of um, internal improvements in banks, in the idea that people should be able to invest in their lives in this way. Um, and so he opposes Democrats who are very anti-bank, who are very anti-internal improvement. Uh, that's one of the reasons why he, he held so close to the Whig party. Uh, the Know Nothing party uh, was a um, anti-Catholic party, uh, an, a nativist party, a, a group of people who um, oppo opposed immigrants. Um, I'm not sure Lincoln was all that committed to it. He definitely had his questions there, um, but it was an alternative party to the Democratic Party and he hated the Democratic Party. He thought that the Democratic Party was wrong in part because they had adhered so much uh, to pro-slavery positions. So the Republican party is really representative of that anti-slavery move. Uh, of his growing concerns about slavery in the United States and the potential uh, for slavery to expand northward. Uh, so that's sort of the evolution. His concerns shift as the situation shifts. Uh, and for him, a lot of it is about winning elections, right? So in 1848, he is um, involved in a group of congressmen who really want to promote Zachary Taylor uh, to become president. He's a, he's a war hero. Lincoln believes that Taylor can be elected. And so he's in favor of Taylor, even though Taylor is a slaveholder, because he believes that Taylor will be able to bring big policies uh, to the United States. So Lincoln is a practical politician. I think he would have called himself a practical politician. Uh, and that's sort of how he approaches the situation is to say, okay, well, how do I achieve my goals? I want to do it in the most practical way possible. Great. Um, a follow on question to that was that in the um, film, you mentioned the Supreme Court, and we talked about this today, too, wasn't as powerful in the 1850s as it is or perceived to be now. And he asks when that changed and how. It's such a great question. It really starts to shift at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century, but isn't really crystallized until about the mid 20th century. Um, quite famously in Cooper versus Aaron uh, is the Supreme Court case that most people point to. But what happens over the course of the 19th century um, is Congress starts to give the court more and more power. It eliminates circuit writing. It gives them. It gives uh, federal courts more jurisdiction over questions uh, that it hadn't been able to hear before. And so Congress, in part because they are tired of hearing cases that make them make their constituents mad, right? They're tired of engaging in politics in ways uh, that get people angry at them. They're like, oh, we'll let the court handle it. And by doing that, it creates more and more power for the Supreme Court that they then go ahead and run with. Uh, and and so, you know, you have the early Supreme Court of the 20th, early 20th century um, engaging in all kinds of super uh, serious power moves, uh, slap down a little bit. Uh, but then, you know, by the end of the 20th century, people are very committed to this idea. Hmm. Christopher asks what the rela political relationship is between popular sovereignty and state sovereignty. Oh, such a good question. Um, they're sort of they're sort of in opposition uh, because state sovereignty is a is a commitment right to state rights to the idea that states um, have the power to determine what's in the constitution and to decide they don't agree with whatever um, is happening in the federal government. Uh, whereas popular sovereignty is more based in the idea of the people rule the people in general. Now it's applied in this case in the Kansas Nebraska Act in terms of state sovereignty, because it's popular sovereignty within the state uh, to determine whether slavery will exist or not exist. But in many ways, those are in conflict, but used, both used by pro-slavery thinkers um, to try to promote their political goals. By, the 18, by 1860, uh, there has been a split, right, between, Frederick, uh, between Stephen Douglas uh, and many of the Southerners who are in favor of states' rights, who are really pushing states' rights arguments uh, about um, their own sort of role in American society and whether they can secede. But for a long time, those things worked in concert, despite them 
really not being the same thing or necessarily uh, working together. Mm. There's a two-part question from Mary Crane, and you, you've already referenced part of this in James Madison shifting from seeing the Constitution as a set of ideas and malleable. Um, and so she, her question was about how the Founding Fathers saw the role of the Supreme Court um, and if they wished the Constitution to evolve or not. Um, and then the second part being, if did what did, did Lincoln see the Supreme Court's job as in deciding what the Constitution meant or not? And if not, what did he see the role as? Such good questions with lots of big answers. So let me see what I can do. I'm gonna start with Lincoln first and then we'll go back to James Madison. Um, so most people in the 19th century believed in judicial review. That's the idea that the Supreme Court could hear an individual case decide the outcome of that case and that that might serve as a precedent in the future, but not necessarily, right? Like it gives, a, it gives an outline of how you might handle those kinds of cases in the future. They did not see necessarily the Supreme Court as the final authority over the constitution. That's something we call judicial supremacy. Uh, they did not mostly adhere to that idea. There were people who agreed with that. Um, and quite famously, John Marshall is sort of a proponent of some version of judicial supremacy, not quite what we have today, but some version of that. Uh, so that had existed in some form. But in general, people did not believe the court had the power to determine what the Constitution meant permanently. Everybody had the ability to participate in that conversation. So the court is a court. I mean, what is a court, right? A court is trying to actually determine the outcome of a particular case. And that's exactly what people saw the court as. So to go back to the 1790s, the Supreme Court hears so few cases in the 1790s, you probably don't know any of them because most of the constitutional controversies happen in Congress. That's where people are working out the meaning of the constitution. The Supreme Court is there in part to help bring the law to the people. So that's what circuit writing is all about, right? People are going to ride circuit, bring the law to their areas, right? Riding circuit in places like Philadelphia. People would go to Philadelphia and they would hold their courts and other people would come and watch the courts and the justices in these circuit uh, positions would try to sell the constitution and the idea of the United States as this grand experiment. So their role was much more political and it was much less involved in sort of the constitutional questions that we think are so important. People would have been totally horrified, the people of the 19th century to learn what the Supreme Court is today. They, they had no idea that it would ever become what it is today, which is not to say that that's wrong. It's just to say that it's very different from the original understanding of what the court was there to do. They would have been very much in favor, Madison in particular, in these early years of reimagining what the Constitution would be over time uh, through amendments. You know, it, it is not necessarily the case that amendments have to be that difficult to pass, right? That was not necessarily the vision, but also just interpreting what the Constitution meant. It didn't have to be as consistent as we expect. They believed that the political circumstances would change. And so once the political circumstances changed, you have to apply those ideals in new ways. And they did throughout the entire early Republic when they were president, right? When Madison was president, when Jefferson was president, they had different ideas about how the constitution should work from those early. I mean, the Louisiana Purchase, which is the origin of all of this conflict, right? Uh, certainly Jefferson would not have argued in 1789 that acquiring a whole bunch of territory was something that was constitutional, but circumstances change and people adjust to those new political circumstances and, and Jefferson believed what he did was okay. So mm -hmm. it's always in flux in that way. Yeah, constant evolution. So we have time for one more question-ish. Phyllis is already coming on, but we're gonna squeeze this last one in because it comes to us from Fernando who's in Venezuela. And oh, he wow. notes that in Spain and the Hispanic countries and the continent, slavery also existed. And in the interest of time, he, he lists several examples of that, but also speaks to the fact that there were other um, legal and cultural factors that were different, like interracial marriage being legalized in 1514 by King Fernando of Aragon, et cetera. And he says, in my country, Venezuela, several mestizos, son of Spaniards and native Indians were involved in the foundation of several cities in the 16th century and asks if you think the fact that interracial marriage was illegal um, 
until 1967 um, did not help in the abolishment of slavery in the United States. So I think he's acting if he's asking the question of whether um, the denial of other rights and sort of the segregation in society was a factor in it taking so long to abolish slavery. Yeah, U.S. slavery evolves in very different ways um, from other countries, uh, in large part because it becomes self-sustaining so early. Right, meaning that uh, there is not a need to import more enslaved people in order to reproduce the population. And one of the consequences of that is the legal structure that forces over time a division between white and black, right? That's that one drop rule where if you are have one drop of black blood, then you must be a black person under the law. Uh, and as a result of that, right, there is a lot more sort of, um, uh, separation of race that doesn't exist in the same ways in lots of other countries where racial categories are much more fluid. And there are many categories, right? Um, today, we might understand that differently, but certainly in the 19th century, people described it as black or white. That was the difference uh, that existed. Great. Great. Dr. Rachel Sheldon, director of the Richard Civil War Era Center at Penn State University. You mentioned that you're in Washington, D.C. right now, my former home, um, and you're working on a lot of research. Can you tell us when your next book will be published? Oh, it's such a great question. I, I wish I had an actual date for you. Um, it'll be I, it'll be about two years from now. Uh, I'm, I, it is under contract with the University of North Carolina's trade division. Uh, and um, I'm currently a, a, have a National Endowment for the Humanities Fellowship to finish the research, and hopefully we'll have that ready to go in about a year. And then it takes, you know, the production schedule takes about another year. Fantastic. Um, we will look forward to that and hopefully to having you back for another program. There are so many questions we didn't get to, but we thank you all so much for your time. Dr. Sheldon, thank you so much. Phyllis, over to you. All right. Thank you, Dr. Sheldon so much for lending your expertise on Lincoln's political evolution to Warning Signs Project and for joining us on tonight's discussion. We're also really grateful for our partnership with Iron Mountain and to be able to continue sharing this project with our members and donors through this online webinar all this fall. Next up, we have a great program featuring Dr. Jonathan White on Wednesday, November 9th at 7 p.m., we're reversing the order of the last two films to fit schedules, so we'll be featuring the premiere of part four of the docuseries, which explores how Lincoln grappled with the unprecedented crisis facing the Republic, his views on self-government, and how we saw progress inspired by the Declaration of Independence, but bound by the Constitution. Please visit our website at lincolnpresidential.org and register for the next session with Dr. White. And the last webinar featuring Dr. Silvana Sadali and the premiere of part three. As you close out tonight's webinar, you will see a short survey. Please take a moment to complete the survey as it helps us to improve our offerings to you and lets us know what you would like to see in the future. As always, thank you to each of you for joining us this evening and we look forward to seeing you all in November. Good night. <laughs>